आर्काइव्स ऑफ प्रसार भारती प्रेजेंट्स द टाइमलेस ट्रेजर ऑफ गोल्डन एरा हेलो वन वॉम वेलकम टू आर स्पेशल सीरीज टॉकिंग टेल्स आई एम मनोज माइंडकर एंड विथ मी इन द स्टूडियो टुडे इज अ वेरी स्पेशल गेस्ट ही इज एन एजुकेशनिस्ट ही इज बीन अ जर्नलिस्ट ही इज अ राइटर एंड मेनी ऑफ हिज बुक्स हैव गानर्ड अ क्लेम सम ऑफ देम हैव बीन बेस्ट सेलर्स एंड ही इज ऑल्सो अ सोशल कॉमेंटेटर इफ यू स्पेशली रीड हिज बुक्स It's a pleasure and a privilege to welcome Nalin Mehta to our studios. Thank you very much uh, Manoj uh, an absolute pleasure to be here and thanks very much for the generous words. Lots of questions in mind but we decided to begin with your latest book India's Decade Digital Revolution and Change in the World's Largest Democracy. Now what caught my attention at the outset was professor robin jeffries uh, remarks a classic a book that will be read widely and for a long time its readership will include scholars political activists and anyone whose job or interest lies in understanding contemporary india and the processes that have shaped it nalin tell me how did you suddenly jump into the trajectory of technology rather than other areas of uh, life so i started my academic work 15 hmm. 20 years ago hmm. uh, writing on the politics of media hmm. on satellite television and what tech did hmm. and forces and the forces of globalization did huh. to our politics to our society and so on and then i um, i'm a political scientist by training hmm. and a journalist by profession hmm. uh, and an academic as well um so um i've kind of my work has transversed both politics hmm. political economy as well as media and tech hmm. um now on this book in particular my last book was called the new bjp hmm. which looked at the transformation of indian politics hmm. post 2014 hmm. uh, the idea being uh, being uh, idea being to keep ideology aside hmm. and to answer the question why has the bjp been winning more elections than it's lost hmm. since 2014 hmm. or even when it's lost why is it doing better than before hmm. what has significantly changed Uh, why is it getting a cross section of voters across gender class caste in a hmm. way that it never did before okay now while i was doing that um, to answer your question directly hmm. um uh, you know uh, what i learned while doing that was a uh, that that a large part of that accrued from um the digital revolution hmm. um both in terms of communication but also in terms of what it did to our society through direct benefit transfers the relationship between the poor hmm. and the state so in the sense that, that uh, you know it, it wasn't just hindu nationalism hmm. there was a far deeper shift happening which was enabled by technology so what was your starting point so that's why so when in that book i was looking at this from a political lens hmm. uh, but this the the tech transformation of india hmm. was the i i felt it merited a se- separate study by itself hmm. from this lens keeping the politics aside completely hmm. uh, and the reason for that was that look when we th- think about tech disruptions we think about the silicon valley hmm. we think about the west more generally yeah. but this re- i'm calling it a digital revolution over the last 15 to 16 years across two ideologically opposite political regimes hmm. india has had a digital trans- revolution of a kind that has never been seen in any country on this scale before hmm. um and what is different from other revolution before hmm. this was enabled by the state not by the private sector okay um and it's changed the underlying plumbing of our society at multiple levels the entire paradigm in yeah. fact but uh, nalin tell me just two decades ago the word disruptive or disruption was a bad word i mean now i mean everyone says oh wow disrupt disruptive hmm. technology so is it uh, in a positive sense or what, what, what is it okay so um i am using it in a very positive way hmm. um um and to if you see in the long arc of indian history if you like hmm. there was a a shift with technology from the 90s onwards with the it re- with the it revolution true, right true. india became the back office hmm. of the world when the companies like infosys and others hmm. became huge um but that affected a certain section of society 
it, it affected techies um, largely. What is happening now uh, hmm. from the mid 2010s onwards is the combination of the cheap mobile phone, hmm. cheap data, hmm. uh, and a digital unique ID system, which is Aadhaar. Hmm. You've had a a, a, a combination of all three which has enabled a digital shift of a kind that is unprecedented and I'll give you three examples of that hmm. uh, UPI is one hmm. uh, UPI has changed the way we deal with money the day, the way we uh, the, the way it's changed the economy completely hmm. in, because today in in August in India had 10 billion transactions on UPI hmm. 46% of the world's digital transactions on money happen in India through UPI hmm. this was unprecedented before hmm. uh, that's one second is uh, you've had a complete transformation of the Indian welfare state. In fact, I am arguing is led to a welfare state 2.0 through direct benefit transfers. Every government before has spent money on development. But the efficiency and the scale uh, that has happened through technology, hmm. and this could never have happened without the cheap mobile phone, cheap data and unique ID systems, which a lot of organizations like IMF, World Bank, you think about Sundar Pichai at Google, think about Sandhya, Satya Nadella at, my, at Microsoft, all of them have been talking rara about this shift in India. Huh. And the third, I think, is um, that that has huge implications, not only for our society, hmm. but also for the future of global tech itself. Hmm. If you look at your, if rather we look at your other books, uh, your first book was India on television. Now, we are curious to know, I mean, the genesis of, because your journey starts mm. from there. So, how exactly did you enter the field of writing? And when I say writing, uh, all your books seem to have a, a, a journalistic edge, mm. if you like. So, how did this book begin, India on television? Okay, uh, thanks. You've been very perceptive about my writing. Um, so, um, how it began was that I began my professional career as a journalist, as a TV journalist. Mm -hmm. We were the part of the early generation mm -hmm. of uh, of satellite television in India. So, I was part of the launching team of ZTV mm -hmm. originally when Z News was launched. Uh, then, when Star News was launched by Indian TV, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and I used to cover politics and I used to also anchor television. Mm. Um, at some point, after about four or five years of, of doing that, I kind of felt that, um, that I wanted to step back mm. and understand more deeply mm. the impact of what we were doing. Um, because I could see as a television journalist in the late 90s and early 2000s mm. that satellite television was completely changing our politics and our society mm. in ways that at least my generation had not seen before. Mm. Um, and I wanted to understand, you know, as a journalist, you do something and then you move on to the next thing the next day. You know, you can you can see what's happening. You get a ringside view to history. Mm. But, you know, you don't necessarily often get the chance to dig deeper and see bigger shifts. So I, so I went to Australia, to Melbourne, mm. to do a PhD. Um, uh, in political science. And funnily enough, um, uh, after a lot of conversation about a year of that, uh, my supervisor then convinced me to write a, a, a social history of Indian television. Oh. Uh, and that's... that's Walking Tales featured... Right, everything from, um, you know, the early television channels, why did they come about? Mm. Why was television or the rise of satellite TV so important to India's economic reforms, mm. which Manmohan Singh had started? Mm. Uh, why was it so, so important in the early phase of globalization, even though it was started as an illegal medium? Mm. Because un until the early 2000s, Indian television and broadcasting was still controlled by the 1885 Indian Telegraph Act, mm. which meant that broadcasting was a state monopoly. Mm. And why didn't the state clamp down on the satellite channels that were broadcasting from Hong Kong? Kong, Singapore, other places into India. And why did the government then work hand in hand without the... So in a sense, th what happened on in TV hmm. was way ahead of the law. The law caught up much later and I think it's still very grey, the law. So that's what Indian television came from. Uh, in the entire list, there's another odd man out and that's sports. Hmm. Now that's difficult to understand. I mean, your interests in... Uh, uh, socio-political subjects is pretty clear, but uh, this is one... So, oh yeah, uh, thanks for that. Um, for sports, um, see, I had never covered sport as a journalist when I started writing as an academic on sport. I was, of course, a sports fanatic huh. um, on cricket, on many other sports. Um, what happened was that, but, you know, as a somebody who played sports or, or obsessed about it as a fan, hmm. I saw it as just sport. 
uh, what happened was that while I was doing my doctoral thesis in Melbourne, um, the International Olympic Committee put out research grants hmm. for people to research Olympic history. So I happened to meet Borya Majumdar, the cricket historian there. Hmm. And he said, you know, why don't we apply for this? And I said, yeah, but you know, you're a cricket historian. I'm not. What will I do in this? He said, no, 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 sports, you know, it's not sports. Nahi hai. Huh. This sports is a mirror to a much larger story. Huh. So, and at that time, I remember um, 2008 Olympics, uh, around that time, uh, uh, um, uh, around, bit, uh, around that time, President ABG Abul, Abdul Kalam was the president. Hmm. He had done a, if you remember, Rajivadha Singh Rathore had won a silver hmm. in the Athens Olympics. And before that, there was a mission Olympics that the Indian Army had launched. Hmm. And the president of India at that point said, only the army can save us. Because every four years you have this handling, you know, the national, which used to happen anyway, that a billion people, no medals. Hmm. So what's wrong with us as a country? And then everyone forgets about it after that for the next four years. So that, those kind of things that were happening at that point made me see sport as a microcosm where forces of nationalism, hmm. pride and social change and also capital. Uh, because a lot of this was Indian Army, but also private sponsorship was coming into sports at that point. Mm. Cricket had already been transformed uh, from not being India's most popular sport mm. into being the biggest sport in the country because of satellite TV, because of TV rights. Mm. Um, so that made me see sport as a prism for a larger story of India. So I went to the IOC, to Lausanne, and there uh, we uncovered the archive there and we found letters going back to the 19, early 1900s from Durabji Tata, from a whole bunch of nationalist leaders. And we uncovered the whole story of Indian hockey. Hmm. Uh, and then, see the thing was, we hear about all these unbroken streak of Indian hockey in the Olympics, 11-12 gold medals in a stretch. Why did that happen? It happened not just because India had some special um, claim to hockey wizardry at that point of time. It happened because it was very much part of Indian nationalism. And, it hap and we discovered in the archive, for example, that these Indian hockey teams were going to various Olympics around the world by crowdfunding, by crowdfunding in the Indian National Congress, hmm. in various nationalist meetings around the country, would raise funds for these guys. You know, Gandhi was famously asked about raising this, and Gandhi said, what is hockey? Hmm. Uh, but that was not the dominant paradigm of that. I mean, these guys were essentially arguing, Dorabji Tata who set up the Indian Olympic movement, he was basically arguing that unless you beat the white man on their own turf in sport, and sport was seen as a form of modernity, hmm. uh, you're not going to be equal. And that's what, that's what drove a lot of Indian hockey. Coming back, Nalin, to your book, uh, India's Decade, uh, we would like you to dwell on the last chapter of it, mm. where you, 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 know, you almost see the way ahead, the way India's moving. So, a few points on what you have uh, written in this particular chapter. Right. So, um we we've had a digital revolution for sure. Hmm. UPI I've talked about, direct benefit transfers I've talked about. Uh, um, what we have not had hmm. is regulation to regulate this in a significant way. Because until very recently, all of Indian tech was regulated by uh, the IT Act, of uh, which was set up in the early 2000s. Hmm. Um, now, for the first time, uh, I, what I do in the end of the book is I look at the challenges ahead hmm. and the first challenge is of regulation so for the first time the Digital Privacy Act has now just been passed by Parliament in the hmm. last session um, and that is, put, that is the first step the second step now it has to be operationalized by setting up various boards and so on the Digital Personal Data Protection yes, Act absolutely hmm. so that has just been passed um, Along with that, uh, in the next session of Parliament, the current plan, at least, is to pass a Digital India Act, hmm. uh, which will provide an overarching regulatory structure, hmm. if the Act is passed indeed, to what is happening. Now, all of these raise concerns about while tech has been uh, significantly positive for Indian for Indian society. And mm. the Supreme Court ruled on this when it gave a judgment on Aadhaar that, look, there was a concern on one side about the totalitarian state, about Big Brother watching us and data. On the other side, social good. Mm. And the Supreme Court basically said that on balance, this is good for India. Mm. And therefore, everything, we let, let this all happen with Aadhaar, but with adequate safeguards. Mm. So what is happening now is the legislative structure for all of this is now being laid out mm. to roll it out. For example, on AI. What kind of regulation should we have on artificial intelligence? And I think the approach of this government is uh, is 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 
very clear and progressive which is that you can't really be prescriptive beyond a point mm. uh, you uh, have very simplistic language and you put out a set of principles mm. and then you go because you know today what you decide today may not be relevant after after a year in ai for example True. Uh, and then you evolve it based on that so right now the first law has been passed mm. the second overarching law is on the is is on the horizon uh, um, just in a in a couple of months and a lot of other ancillary rules around that mm. are now being formulated so that's the first thing uh, i think the um, second thing mm. is that there are big questions on sovereignty and big tech um so um this is specific to um uh, around the world hmm. when you have uh, tech giants like google like hmm. amazon facebook meta uh, they not only control um the 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 digital highways if you like hmm. but can also but also i mean also there are question of sovereignty in that so i think part of the part of the debate happening globally in big tech is how do you regulate it and india is at the center of it for example um i remember when um, australia put in place new regulations to regulate uh, uh how google would deal with mass media publication and they had to pay them hmm. prime minister modi and the prime minister of australia actually had a conversation about it and the com- the fact that both pmos decided to make that public hmm. was a signal uh, and that was interesting because india is at the very center of the um uh, tech debate globally not just uh, because it's india but the future of global tech is linked to india china has closed off as a market india is the biggest growth market separately and what is happening within the indian market will pretty much define ne- the next innovation loop mm-hmm. um the third i think is india has built digital public infrastructure of a kind uh that has added significantly to its soft power hmm. it is added signif- it is become a tool of indian diplomacy in a, in the in the way that the Ch- chinese for example use the one belt one road initiative hmm. so if you saw in the g20 the dpi was very much at the center of india's uh concerns yeah. and it, it was in the G- in the delhi declaration as well what that means is at last count something like 65 countries uh the last time i checked had expressed an interest in using aspects of the indian digital public infrastructure mm. which is which used to be called india stack earlier which mm. nandan nilikani had built uh, originally mm. uh now it's called digital public infrastructure um so for example countries like philippines are now using uh, are now putting in place a system like aadhar mm. countries like ethiopia mm. countries like sri lanka several countries are now doing that upi has now gone to sing- you know this tie up with singapore with pay now there's a tie up with uae uae there's a tie up with uh, the europeans with france in particular so how this goes forward mm. is has implications for india soft power and our diplomacy as well but the structures mm. will they will the current structures be will suffice will they suffice or do we need to build a new global commons these are these are open questions nalin well in a lighter vein uh your extensive notes at the end of this book if i were a student uh you know wanting to appear for an entrance exam i would go through the notes as well they are so extensive uh i have never seen a book that so honestly i mean you you kind of tell each and every detail of uh, all your endeavor so uh, thank you so um, on notes uh, i think uh, we live in an age of transparency hmm. and the way i look at my writing is that i don't see it as opinion writing Uh, because any everybody has an opinion right um why is my opinion more valid than yours mm. uh, or vice versa uh, i i i the reason i write or these books i write is because i'm trying to understand for myself and mm. for this society hopefully mm. what is the larger trend we are seeing what shift are we seeing now in order to do that i think it is incumbent on me mm. to document exactly what is the basis for every argument i am making mm. and therefore the notes come uh, for that reason this is actually a small book if you saw my last book the new bjp it had 300 pages 350 pages of notes okay. um um uh, and uh, and about 10 15 appendices because i think uh, uh, most people a lot of people will not be interested in the notes but mm. for those who want to delve in deeper mm. i want to give them a kind of a road map okay, uh, okay. to to understand for themselves and explore this deeper should they want to and also to interrogate interrogate where the hell is is this material coming from that he's talking about we've had enough of books let's now touch upon another aspect of your personality and that's as an educationist 
What comes to mind, if you look at the entire global mix that you have been exposed to, Australia, Switzerland, uh, what else? Singapore, uh, India, of course. Yeah. Uh, just briefly, what comes to the curious mind is, uh, you know, the way education is imparted in, hmm. in, uh, uh, in all these places, vis-a-vis -vis India. Hmm. So, um, I have three degrees, uh, all three from different countries, hmm. Australia, UK and India. Hmm. Um, I've taught also in two or three, three or four countries uh, and in India as well. Hmm. Um, to me, um, one of the reasons I came, moved back to India after living um, for, uh, for about 14, 15 years overseas in several countries was because um, I think there is a deep uh, there is a big difference in the way our education system works hmm. and the way the uh, education system works in more in other liberal democracies. Hmm. Uh, I.e., um, in those countries, um, an Australian system was very similar to the British system, which is, uh, it is not prescriptive. Hmm. It is, uh, you are exposed to different ideas and you explore and it's very research-based. Yeah. And that was very different from what I had experienced here. Hmm. And I felt that if you want... Um, I think it's very a lot of change is now happening in Indian education. Hmm. The new education policy is part of that to do it in schools, also in colleges, in universities, uh, to have more flexibility, hmm. to uh, to 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 give people interdisciplinarity, to work across disciplines. And I think um, we should take the best of what's there in other countries, hmm. but then adapt it to our own needs. I think if we just copy it blindly. We're going to make a terrible mistake. Uh. We talked about television. Have you ever had any, you know, exposure to radio? Uh, yes, actually with you. <laughs> um, um, many years ago when I was a first year college student and you would not remember, uh, uh, is that um, you were, a, uh, you, in, I think in this studio perhaps, or actually in the first floor studio of All India Radio, uh, there was a show that you used to curate called In the Groove. I and remember. I anchored a show of it. Um, and we did it on on rock, and I still remember playing "Time" from Pink Floyd, and and so on. Pink Floyd opens up a Pandora's box. What are your interests in music? So I uh, listen a lot to old Hindi music. Hmm. Um, I've recently started uh, got uh, developed an interest in classical Indian music as hmm. well. Hmm. Um, but apart from that. Um, Compared to my wife, for example, she thinks I'm a cultural Neanderthal. So, you know, I, I don't claim to have any great knowledge of music. No, but uh, if you remember your In the Groove, and as you said, you played Pink Floyd. Uh, definitely in those days, of course, like all your college mates, uh, Western music, especially rock, must have been uh, part of the diet. Oh, absolutely. I mean, at that point when we were growing up, uh, there was all the rock from the 80s, hmm. which was, or from the 70s, you know, classic Beatles, rock. The yeah. classic rock uh -huh. uh, uh, that was still very popular in, in colleges. Um, there was also rap that was just coming in at that point of time. Hmm. Um, uh, and a lot of early pop had started. But to me, I think rock speaks to me a lot more than other forms obviously, of music. Obviously, obviously. I mean, for a thinking person, <laughs> obviously. Uh, as we come to the end of our little conversation, I mean, any other aspect of your life and personality that, you know, you could share with our viewers or possibly uh, any any interest of yours, a hobby of yours? So, uh, two things. I am uh, I'm deeply interested in ancient Indian history. Hmm. And I've, I've been, for the last 15 years or so, I've been kind of researching on that, hmm. uh, on aspects of the early Indian past. Uh, and maybe there's a book there somewhere at some point. But more than anything else, hmm. um, you know, I wear various hats as a journalist, as a writer, as an academic, and so on. But the most important thing for me outside of all of this is that I'm, is my two kids. Hmm. So I spend a lot of time with them, um, or I try to in, anyway. And I constantly feel, guil feel guilty that I'm not doing enough. Uh, but I think being a dad to me is more important than anything else that I do. Let us uh, part with, well, another uh, curiosity from my side. Uh, is a third child, in the form of a book, of course, is it in the offing? Uh, yes. 
uh, I'm currently working on uh, on a couple of projects. Hmm. Uh, w- uh, one of them, if all goes well, uh, should see the light uh, of day early next year. Hmm. Uh, but it's still a work in progress, so we'll see what happens. Any any connection with uh, ancient history or something? No, no. Uh, that's a much longer term project. <laughs> okay, it was great talking to you, Nalin. After so many years, I mean. and wish you all the best for all your uh, future books and your future endeavors thank you very much thank you very much